And you're watching Book TV on C-SPAN 2. We are at Catholic University in Washington, D.C., interviewing some of the professors who are also authors. And now joining us is Alexander Rousseau, who is the author of this book, Points on the Dial, The Golden Age of Radio Beyond the Networks. Alexander Rousseau, who invented radio? Well, that's a complicated uh, answer. And, uh, you know, the Marconi op often gets credit for it, um, but like many of these stories, there are lots of different actors op operating um, at lots of different times. And that kind of institutional history or erasure um, is one of the reasons why I wanted to write this book. Um, you know, I initially conceived it thinking um, about our current moment and the tendency of media industries to not particularly turn on a dime. Right, we see lots of industries in our current, uh, current era trying to figure out what to make of digital convergence. Um, what struck me about radio, particularly radio starting in the 1940s and 1950s, is how quickly it had adapted to the introduction of television. Um, very quickly you had a return to profitability um, by, these, by the radio industry as a whole. Um, but when I began to scratch the surface a bit, reading different kinds of trade literature and looking in different archives, I began to see that a lot of the things that had been talked about as new at that moment, things like uh, multiple radios in the house or things like local advertising sales, kept being called new um, in preceding years. And I kept going back and going back and going back and eventually I was back in the 1920s in the start of what is sometimes called the network era. Um, and so what, I had this, what this book then became was a way to tell that story, the story of a, an alternative um, t system of radio programming, of radio technologies, of radio listening techniques um, that was uh, not really, that had not received a lot of scholarly attention because most of the um, work on radio, and very good work, I might, I might add, um, focuses on national networks, the, the, the big organizations, the big stars, the, you know, the Bing Crosbys, the Jack Bennys that um, are, are often remembered in, uh, of that era. Um, so what I found is, in fact, that there, that there was uh, a, a parallel uh, kind of radio industry at this time. Um, and I began to uh, explore different facets of it. Uh, I looked at you know, the way that um, and for, many, uh, for many years of this so-called national network era, r radio wasn't necessarily national. The networks did, you know, did not physically reach um, across the country. They left out vast swaths of it, particularly in the South and, and, in, the, and in the West. Um, and so what does that mean for the communities um, who listened to those, uh, or to listen to radio. Sometimes they could get the, uh, you know, the, uh, they could hear stations from big cities, but did they have their own radio culture? And, and, what, and what, was, what did that sound like? Uh, so I then began to find all these other ways in which radio programs re were distributed. There were um, these companies called transcription disc companies, and they would basically produce, um, uh, everything that you would possibly need to put on your own radio show. They'd provide commercial copy, they'd provide the musical selections, some of them would even provide the filing cabinets to store all of this stuff. Um, and for local stations, they began to use these kind of services to put on localized programs. So they weren't purely local, they weren't uh, purely national. There was a level of interpretation that was going on to make these kind of programs uh, acceptable uh, to uh, their, that local audience. And they began to put in local references and local brands uh, or regional brands um, uh, for, different kinds of, uh, for different kinds of products. Uh, you mentioned that you were from, from Indiana uh, earlier, and I, one, one example I can remember is they, um, the Wrigley Company wasn't able to, um, or Beech Nut Company, that wasn't able to advertise gum or they didn't want to advertise it there because of the um, connections it had with covering over um, the uh, alcoholic breath smell, right? Because, you know, Indiana was, was sort of very much a dry area at that time. Uh, so these are the kind of localizations and regionalizations that I, um, that I, I cover in this book. 
Um, and, and there are other examples of that. I look at um, a really interesting guy from Boston named John Shepard. Uh, and he um, managed a couple department stores. Um, and he saw um, in radio the ability to really connect with what he saw as a unique audience, the New England audience. Um, and he created a regional radio network um, that aired uh, baseball games, uh, local university football games, uh, homemaker programs, all of which was designed to drive sales, of course, to his, his local department stores. Um, but in so doing, what, he's do what he did is you know, created the idea of a New England network that was, dis or New England market, uh, that was distinct from the mass audience and the mass product um, uh, that, that is typically thought about in terms of uh, national radio at this time and those big national brands and the, and the big stars. Um, and so there, you know, there are different sort of cases uh, like that. that when did these regional or local radio stations start to form? Right in the 20s when radio uh, abso Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Shepard uh, Shepard had a was a pioneering Boston broadcaster, um, and you know, and he often. Um, I mean, I shouldn't say I, I shouldn't. Ha I shouldn't give the impression that Shepard was completely separate from the national networks. He was at various times affiliated with all the national uh, radio networks um, in his station. So he wanted to bring in that uh, that <laughs> top flight talent and those big stars, um, but he also wanted to make sure that. Through, uh, and other points in the day that he could provide other kinds of programs. So, you know, his, uh, his regional, uh, what was called the Yankee Network, and then he had a, a spare one called, the, another one called the Colonial Network. Um, you know, they started in the late 1920s as well and, and sort of steadily expanded into the 1930s. Um, and one of the interesting things about him in particular is that he was a real pain in, uh, in, the, in the rear of the, of the networks. They disliked him um, tremendously. They needed him. Uh, because of uh, his access to the lucrative Boston and New England market, which was very dense um, and you know an industrial industrialized uh, region with uh, high wages, um, but they were kind of making a you know a deal with the devil they felt, um, and so there are repeated clashes between Shepard and these uh, different networks. At one point, you know NBC kicked him off, and you know CBS kind of took him back, but not. Um, but not with, uh, without many misgivings. Um, and that's important because it says that there's, um, unlike a lot of fears about a national uh, media culture that you know, obliterates the local or obliterates these other kinds of culture, in someone like Shepard, um, you can see uh, some sort of pushback um, and some sort of uh, hybrid culture that um, wasn't necessarily going to take everything that the uh, national culture uh, offered up. Was the radio industry from the start an advertising-based industry? Um, there was a fair amount of skepticism around uh, radio broadcast or radio advertising um, in the 1920s. Um, no, no, that you know, a deeply progressive liberal named Hubert Hoover actually you know decried what advertising would do to radio when he was Secretary of Commerce. Um, but it quickly became supported by advertising. Uh, and that was, uh, there were, um, you know, there, there were educational stations, um, and, but they, they were, they tended to not have very powerful signals. Uh, there were a number that were uh, quite popular, especially in the, um, in the, uh, around uh, Big Ten and agricultural um, universities um, that survived, but there weren't all that many nonprofit stations. And, in about 10 years, my colleague uh, here at Catholic will have a book on that for you, but um, that's, look, that's looking ahead. So. Were the NBCs, the Mutuals, the CBSs threatened by these local networks? Um, I don't know if they were necessarily threatened. Um, they, they, sort of, they saw them as obstacles, potentially, to uh, what they wanted to do in terms of controlling the maximum amount of, of scheduled time. Um, but, you know, for example, Shepard was one of the founding partners of Mutual, um, partly as a, you know, reaction to um, his dealings with NBC, the NBCs and CBS. But um, for that reason, um, they're, they're, it really is a kind of, um, you know, mutual antipathy, but acceptance, um, mostly because these, these different, these stations tended to operate in different times when the, the national networks weren't offering um, sponsored programs and things like that. 